We are very happy to have Greg from Brandeis, and he will tell us about the protecting content information with a long range interaction. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for having me. It's really great to be back here at GeoFlow in person. I'm really glad to see a lot of familiar faces here. And I'm going to be telling you today about some work that I've been up to with um, Andrew Daly at University of Strathclyde and Brian Swingle at Brandeis. Uh, okay, so one of the things that we learned about quantum mechanics, first of all, is that entanglement is very, very useful, but often entanglement is very fragile. And a really good example of this is something called the GHC state or the cat state. And this is a many body entangled state that we've all written down before, I'm sure. And it has this phase factor in here that contains some information. And it's actually really useful for measuring things. Um, unfortunately, this phase just gets destroyed by any single local measurement of any one of these qubits. Um, and so that just completely collapses this state. And this is particularly problematic if you're interested in building up lots of many body entanglement in an experiment, because your experiment is always coupled to your environment. And so you're always being measured by your environment and exchanging quanta with it. And so if you're going to try to build a Schrodinger cat state, you're going to have a lot of trouble. So more recently, though, um, a surprising uh, new discovery that was made just a couple of years ago by these folks here is that uh, you can actually design many body quantum systems that have volume law entanglement, despite the presence of continuous measurements. And this is a very surprising fact, given what I just told you. The reason this works um, is that on the one hand, we have scrambling dynamics. Well, let me set up a picture first. So it's a bit, suppose you have a bunch of qubits down here, and I'm going to apply a bunch of gates to them. And so this uh, uh, ends up scanning out a, a tensor network. Um, this, uh, these gates in here are going to scramble information and cause that information to delocalize. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in, and every so often, I'm going to just poke this thing with a measurement, which is I'm going to represent by one of these red Xs. <clears throat> And the scrambling dynamics tend to generate entanglement, whereas the measurements tend to destroy this. And if your scrambling is strong enough, you can actually end up having a, ro uh, having a robust phase of entanglement here, volume law entanglement, even though you're measuring the system. So this is very cool and very surprising. At the same time, I've been interested recently in studying systems that you can build in the laboratory, say using Rydberg atoms, that can scramble information very, very quickly. So that can rapidly delocalize this information. And in particular, one of the systems I've been thinking about a lot recently is this power of two couples model. And you can realize this with some shuffling. I can tell you about that if you're interested. But the point here is that you can realize these hypercube graphs in these uh, many body interacting systems. And you can just see kind of intuitively that this graph is going to spread information throughout the system very, very quickly. And you can show actually that these systems are fast scramblers. They scramble information at the fastest rate allowed by the fast scrambling injection. Okay, so everything I've told you so far, uh, I've told you that these uh, many body volume law entangled phases are stabilized by scrambling. And so the strength of scrambling should play an important role here. And I've also told you that I know how to build circuits in the laboratory that fast scramble. So a natural question to ask here is, is this a general principle? Can we sort of protect information or protect entanglements in these systems using long range interactions? And exactly how does that work? What kinds of non-local interactions? There's a, a, a broad set of questions here. Okay, and I, I am not the first person, nor will I be the last. Um, there are plenty of folks here in the audience who have studied this question recently. Um, and in particular, I wanna point out this recent paper um, from some folks here. And this actually inspired a lot of the stuff I'm gonna be talking about today. Okay, so the outline for my talk today, I'm going to explore this question in two very specific models. One is a Clifford circuit uh, using these non-local sparse interactions. And the second one, if I have time, uh, I would like to talk about uh, Brownian models, which feature all-to-all -all interactions and also this power law decaying interaction. Okay, so first of all, let's talk about these, uh, these scrambling circuits. So these circuits consist of non-local gates where gates are applied between qubits i and j if and only if the distance between them on a 1D lattice is a power of two. Okay, so here for nearest neighbor interactions, you're just gonna get this is k equals, this parameter k here is gonna tell you what the longest range interactions are. So for k equals one, you just get nearest neighbor because those are separated by a power of two to the zero. Here at k equals two, you get a power of two to the one, and so you get next nearest neighbor. And then you start missing some, you start getting sparse interactions and only get uh, interactions here at powers of two. This is k equals three and k equals four. And you can see that as I go up to larger and larger k here, a, a bunch of the degrees of freedom, are, or a bunch of the interactions between degrees of freedom are missing. And that's actually because you don't need them 
um, these interactions will spread information throughout the entire system sufficiently by themselves. So the point is, is that these systems can be, um, in principle, implemented in a laboratory. And we also have this parameter K that tunes between sort of a nearest neighbor slow scrambling system on the one hand. And over here, we have this fast scrambling system on the bottom. And we have this parameter K that can sort of tune back and forth. And so I'm going to be studying this as a function of K. But to tell you what I'm actually going to calculate and how I'm going to diagnose this transition, we need to set up a little bit. So <clears throat> here's the circuit that I'm going to stick in. And this is my scrambling circuit with some measurements. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to maximally entangle all of these qubits here with a reference. And if this entanglement, if this tensor network basically gets torn apart by these measurements, that means that there's no longer any correlation between Q and R. So that's going to be the diagnosis that tells us that our entanglement has sort of fallen apart. So let me just say that again. So if, if we have volume law entanglement here, and if this tensor network is really all connected together, then we expect to have maximal entanglement entropy between these two. And that's diagnosed by this guy here. This is I'm plotting uh, time here as I continue to run my circuit. Whereas if I have too many measurements and it destroys my entangled phase, then this entropy just drops to zero. So that's going to be the diagnostic, the, the diagnostic I'm going to use for this. OK, and again, if we stick in now my non-local circuit, uh, how do these, how does this K non-locality um, impact the ability of this circuit to, to store information? OK, so um, just to put this in, in really concrete terms, this is the actual circuit I'm going to be working with. Here I have my local interactions. Here I have my next nearest neighbor. And here I have some longer range sparse interactions and some even longer range sparse interactions. And then in between, I'm going to hit these with some projective measurements and see if this tensor network sticks together or falls apart. Yeah. So when, when you say no local uh, interactions, do you mean no local in one D? Yes. Possibly in one D. Yeah. In, in for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to be focusing just on this one D chain, and all I mean is just non-local in that sense. And if you so if you do that and you rearrange the sites into that hyper, you'll find that it's a hypercube. It, it, so it, it is a hypercube. It will be local in some dimension. Exactly, exactly. Well, it's it's local. Yeah, it's a hypercube, so it's local in log base 2n dimension. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so here, uh, with measuring entanglement of Q and R, you could not substitute to the entanglement generated by scrambling dynamics. Yeah. So if you have no scrambling at all, then you would still. So yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. So that, yeah, if you had, if you had, you want to say, uh, well, let me say this. So if you had no scrambling at all between these two guys, and I started applying measurements, that's going to immediately produce. So I start out with an EPR pair, a bunch of EPR pairs between my, and I have no scrambling, and I apply local measurements, that's going to immediately collapse my EPR pair, right? And so it destroys any entanglement that I have here. Whereas if I do have scrambling, then I'll maintain that entanglement. Does that does that answer your question? I'm just confused on what's the so you have this picture in the previous slide that you have one system and within that one system you go from area law to volume law. But now you have you don't look at the details of that single system at all. You just apply it to Yeah, the that's system. right. So it will be Yes, exactly. This is a great question. So there are actually multiple ways of probing what's going on in this tensor network. And so one way is to look at what's happening. Let me actually just go to this slide here. So here's the cartoon picture you should have. And it, okay, so exactly what you're saying here is one way I can probe this transition is I can look at entanglement entropy just of small regions A up here. Okay, and if this tensor network is broken apart, then as I increase the size of that region, I'm going to start, you know, this part is volume law entangled. But as I start going to multiple disconnected regions, I'm no longer going to get volume on thing, right? So that's one way of probing it. And that's not what I'm talking about today. So it's a good question. What I'm talking about is the correlations between the output and the input qubits, which I'll show actually these, well, I won't show in this talk, sorry. You can show that these two transitions for most circuits are identical. And that because they just correspond to this tensor network being torn apart by measurements. But yes, that you're technically correct that there are two different transitions here. One it having to do with volume versus area law up here, and the other having to do with correlations in time. Yeah. And so today, we're going to be doing the, the correlations in time. Yeah, that's a great question. OK, so I set up my 
circuit, and I'm interested in looking for the critical measurement rate. How many measurements can I stick into this circuit before it falls apart? Okay. So, yeah. so is there an advantage to consider these time type of correlations? Rather than the, well, for one, they're just easier to calculate. So just getting a better, yeah. So just if you're trying to get a first handle on things. Um, so for one plus one D circuits without this non-locality, um, there is good numerical evidence that these are, are identical and, and that one should, should you know, suffice for the other. But there has been some recent thinking from Michael Bellins and David Hughes that maybe if you have all to all interactive systems, you actually might be able to squeeze in another phase in there such that you get volume law entanglement, but you actually separate from the, the reference. So there, there are some subtleties here that are, um, but for, for now, it's mostly just that you're, you're interested, it's, it's easiest to calculate the, the, the reference alone. But later, actually, we are gonna compute the um, entanglement entropies of small areas. So, so the, when you talk about it's easy, it seems that you're suggesting it's from the numerical perspective. How about actually in the lab, what kind of setup? That's an excellent, excellent question. Yeah, um, I'm not gonna be talking at all today about how to measure this in the lab, because as I've mentioned to a couple of you today, it's very non-trivial to do that. And that's the reason for that is that these measurements in here are conditional. So if you're putting this circuit and you wanna actually run this thing in a lab, you have to run this thing and then condition on these, the output of these measurements, right? And so, you know, I, I, I can't in principle force a qubit to go one way or the other. But you know there's this different measurement principle, so you can actually just Yep, you can put them all the way to the end. That's yeah, exactly right. Awesome. So mm -hmm. that makes it easier? It could. Um, let me just say, in the interest of time, it's a very good question, but there are a lot of subtleties with measuring this in the lab. So, sure, yeah, yeah, for the moment, I'm, yeah, especially measuring entropies, for example, which I know is your question. Yeah. The other thing I can say is that, um, um, so Crystal Noel, who's working with uh, Chris Monroe, has done a recent experiment on um, similar circuits uh, using Clifford circuits. And what they have shown is how to convert these entanglement entropies into classical entropies of just bits. So you can, in principle, measure this thing just using uh, entropies of classical bits. But I'm not going to talk about that today, but yeah. OK, yeah, these are all really great questions. Um, thanks for that. So, okay, so uh, the results of these numerical experiments in Clifford circuits are that the, uh, the circuit can, can withstand a much higher rate of measurements uh, when you increase this parameter K. So down here, this is the nearest neighbor local case, uh, and that agrees with the one plus one D result that, that is known from the literature. And then this significantly increases as you increase this value of K. Okay, so that's one nice result. We know that these non-local interactions, perhaps unsurprisingly, uh, you know, increase the rate at which you can measure the system and the entanglement will still stay there. Um, let me just say for, uh, for the experts in the room, uh, we can also measure the critical exponents of this transition. And it turns out that they're pretty much in agreement with the one plus one D case, which is also a little surprising. I don't claim to fully understand that. Um, okay, so now let me move on to another thing. So the reason these, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what we do here is we so we look for this critical point, and then around that critical point we can, um, uh, for example, look at the entanglement entropy, and fit that to the to a scaling form that has some you know some scaling form. Yeah, it's two dimensionality, but it's not tuning. Right, it's not tuning like a, a large 2D lattice or something, or it's going to a large 3D. It's, it's going to this like all to all coupled model. So I, I wouldn't think of K as, you know, you're right that it is a dimension, but it's only a dimension in a hypercube. So it's not some, it's not some extended K dimensional space. You know, we're not living in a large K dimensional. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. So that, that that's what happens here. Actually, if you take k to be log base two, this thing just turns into the all-to-all -all case. So exactly. 
Yeah, you do. And in fact, I should be more careful here. So these critical exponents agree only if you take this k to be less than the so you, the largest way you could make this, the largest interactions you could do would be log base two, right? Because if you put these spins in a ring and you're doing powers of two, the furthest you can go is like all the way across. So all I'm considering here is not that, anything that's smaller. And so I think the right way to think of it is sort of in a renormalization group sense that these non-local interactions are actually irrelevant to the critical, to the critical behavior. So that's interesting. So they're irrelevant to the critical behavior. That's what this suggests anyway. Whereas this non-universal parameter, which is the measurement rate itself, is changing as you as you change k. Yeah. So this still is about correlation between the initial. Yes. And the how, how so, so that was a transition between not seeing correlations and seeing correlations. Yeah. But the correlation you see, do they depend on the system size? You know, when, when, when you're in the phase where you have, you have some some correlations left. Yeah. Uh, do they stay in time? So that would yeah, that's a great time. question. Yeah. So, how about the system size? Right. So this, so the the way to think about it, the cartoon picture is that this there's some short time period where the entanglement, any any like easy to grab entanglement, just gets destroyed by the measurements. That's this little fall off here, and then there's this very long time plateau. But it's not flat actually. Um, these measurements once in a while will extract information from the system. And actually, this whole uh, period is exponentially long in the time. So this this plateau actually decays like a negative logarithm of time. So this is decaying very, 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 very slowly. And this is uh, an exaggeration. But eventually, this thing does not last forever. It does eventually get all you know all of the information that was correlated between these two guys eventually gets eaten you know up by the by the measurements. So that's the is related to what? Yeah. That's a great question. Yeah, I'm not really sure how to think about that here because this is such a non equilibrium. Time scale is, is, is similar to the puzzle and the system size. But it's not like in the perturbation with the system size. So this puzzle will persist with exponential system size all the time. Um, right. If you take the simple dynamic limit first before taking the time to infinity, then you take the system. That's, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. OK, so we see from numerics that this critical point increases a lot and the critical exponents stay basically the same. Um, now, another way to view this phenomenon is, um, well, the reason this entanglement is stable is that there's actually a dynamically generated quantum error correcting code. It's kind of continuously being generated as this thing flows along. OK, that's already very interesting. And uh, so if you have a quantum error correcting code, one of the things you might want to do, one of the first things you're probably going to want to do is characterize the, the code distance and the code rate or the trade-off between those two things. Now, in order to do that in Clifford circuits, um, Lee and Fisher recently pointed out in this nice PRB that um, you can get at this by measuring the mutual information between a subregion A and the reference R. Now, the reason this works, <clears throat> suppose I take the mutual information between A and R here, you can think of this region A as a region on which errors can act in order to somehow disturb the information that's over in R, okay? Now, if you take A to be small enough, you'll find generically in these circuits that actually the mutual information between these two guys drops to zero. So what that means actually is that, so let me say that again, the mutual information when you take A to be small enough, non-zero, but small enough, vanishes. What that means is that any errors that you apply on A, any, any noise or operators you apply on there, won't have any effect on the information at R. Okay? And so this is interpreted as a code distance because, well, I can act with any sort of errors on A and it doesn't affect my information. So those, uh, those errors can be corrected in principle. Yeah. I mean, I understand this, but when you have a unitary dynamic, right, then you know that information is there, 
either in A or A prime, and then you say that the Gaussian formation A and R is zero, then you say that so it should be in A prime, so then you can write A. Right. You need so but, you do but, need to be more careful. Yeah. But now you don't have any free analysis, so not sure if A formation is in A and A prime. A right. R. So, okay, so the, the right way to say this is that uh, at the end of the day, we have a pure state. So because we condition on the measurements, so the circuit that I'm building up is a bunch of unitary gates with measurements, and the measurements I'm always taking to be post-selected. So the state I get at the end is always pure. So this state at the, at the very output here is always going to be pure. And so in that, in that case, you can actually just say, this thing, because I, I agree if this were impure, then I would need more information to say where the information is, yeah. Okay, right, okay. So if I can find this uh, size of A where the mutual information vanishes, yeah. Yes, it does, yes, it does. This statement here that was uh, made in here, it depends very carefully on it. Yes. That's exactly right. Yeah, see, this, this theorem depends on it being Clifford. And I would love to know a more general theorem for codes that are not Clifford, but yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right, okay, so if we then look at this just from numerics, we see this sort of uh, uh, nice behavior that we expect where the mutual information up to a, a certain system size A here vanishes and then after that, you start getting mutual information between the two. And here, this is a, as a function of k. And if, if I go through this whole analysis, I can pick both an R code, a code rate, meaning the number of qubits I'm encoding in this thing. And I can also measure the, the code distance using the procedure I just told you. And these are the sorts of curves that you get. And so you see that the local case, you see this sort of uh, you know regular trade-off here between code distance and code rate. But as you increase the non-locality parameter k, uh, the trade-off gets much, much better. So at any particular fixed code rate, you can actually get a much higher code distance, which means that it's more robust to errors. That's the intuitive way to, to say that. Okay, so the takeaways from this uh, part of the talk are one that we can increase the measurement rate by including non-local interactions. So that's interesting. And we can apparently also improve the code properties here just by adding a few extra layers of gates. And again, like I said before, if you have this k less than long base two, the critical properties, the critical exponents are the same as the one plus one. Okay, and I'll just flash this. This is all up in a new archive paper here. Okay, so that's the first part of my talk. Maybe I'll pause there for any other questions. Yeah, set up for. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes, very related, actually. I should have, yeah. Yes, very related. So, right, these are these are very similar to uh, uh, when you take K to be very large, these are fast scrambling circuits. And so they're nearly identical, uh, not in microscopics, but in, but in observables. They're nearly identical to the zero D all to all models that Tommy was talking about earlier today. And, and so- that's that's right. I would I, I would expect I, yeah that that would be a really cool thing to study exactly. So the, these types of models, yeah, I would expect them to have this um, uh, operator size growth where this thing goes out to some mean and then it has these very large fluctuations, just like Tommy was saying. And then these errors exactly. I expect them to start chopping away at the high size operators. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So. I guess I have a little bit more time. Um, the next part of my talk, I'm going to sort of switch gears now. So this was all about sparse non-local interactions. And now I'm going to switch gears slightly and talk about uh, dense power law interactions, but a lot of the conclusions will be similar. Um, and again, this is very much inspired by some recent Clifford numerics that uh, the folks here have been thinking about. Okay, so the setup I'm going to use is we're going to have um, L clusters of spins of qubits. And in each cluster, there's going to be N qubits. And this N is going to allow us to have large N control over the physics, which is going to be nice. And this L here, the different clusters are going to serve as a one-dimensional uh, uh, one dimensional chain that are going to have long range interactions. 
So the Brownian dynamics, oh, well, I'm going to consider Brownian dynamics on the system. And the reason I'm going to do that is because Brownian dynamics are strong scramblers, and they're also uh, eminently solvable. OK, so we have three ingredients in this model. I'm going to have on-site scrambling controlled by some uh, coupling J. So this is just going to take two qubits in a single cluster and cause some Brownian scrambling between them. Then I'm going to have some long-range uh, couplings where you know, a qubit here couples to a qubit there with some power law decaying interaction. And then finally, I'm going to do these measurements, these on-site measurements. And that's just single qubit measurements. OK, so these are just uh, the three components. And we're going to put these three components into this uh, entangled channel um, and just repeat these guys at, you know, for some delta t time. So little brownian here, little brownian, little weak measurement, and then little brownian, little brownian, little weak measurement, repeated over and over and over again. And I don't have time to derive this for you, but it turns out that this model can be turned after disorder averaging and in the large end limit. It turns out that this model can be described near the critical point by a 5 4 theory with an additional long range term uh, coming from this power law interaction. Okay, so, so if you just drop this for the, for the moment, you know, this is everybody's favorite uh, 5 4 model in two dimensions. Yeah. So is that the motivation for the model that we can solve it this way, or is that a typical representation? I would say mostly this is the reason I'm studying this model. Yeah, that's a good question. And because it's just very easy to understand what's going on. Yeah. yeah Do you have exactly. any intuition why it's effectively yes? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to kind of provide a little bit of, yeah. So yeah, just give me a second here. Um, so, okay, so this is a familiar five to the four model. And this, uh, this uh, delta here is controlled by the, the difference in measurement rates. So if you're above, if, you, if you're measuring uh, sorry, if you're above the critical measurement rate, the mass is positive, and therefore you just have a single minimum. Uh, if this thing is below the critical measurement rate, then we have a regular Z2 symmetry breaking transition in the bulk. And this actually corresponds to, and I haven't told you any of this stuff, but when you do this calculation, you're actually going to get four different replicas, and these two different saddle points correspond to two different correlations you can have between replicas. So in particular, uh, this saddle point here corresponds to correlations between replica one and two and replica three and four. And this one over here corresponds to some swapped conditions. And I'll just give me a second and I'll, I'll this will all hopefully come together. <laughs> so the picture we should have in mind is that I have, I have four replicas and they're sitting in this two dimensional space where one dimension is this length that I have my one dimensional spin chain along and there's long range interactions on that. And then I have the other dimension is time. And I'm, I'm interested in correlations between the, the beginning time and the end time. And when I compute um, uh, Rengi entropies or entropies, that corresponds to sticking in some uh, swap operator at the boundary. And in terms of this model here, that corresponds to just choosing one of these two uh, saddle points. So down here, <clears throat> we're going to start out with these regular uh, correlations, and this is because we injected EPR pairs in the beginning. And at the end, I'm going to be measuring a swap operator to measure the Renyi entropy. And so that's going to change my, my correlations and make my field phi negative. So you should think of this whole thing as being split up into, because this is a, an Ising model, we're going to get domain walls. We're going to get domains and domain walls. So over here, we're going to have a, a swap domain corresponding to phi uh, being positive. And down here, we have an unswapped domain corresponding to phi being negative. And the question is going to be what kind of domain wall separates these two domains? And what can we understand about the physics of this problem based on that domain wall? OK, so at the end of the day, this comes down to be some just long range two dimensional Ising model, which we can understand with, with domain walls. <clears throat> so let me just walk you through the resulting phase diagram that we get based on that picture. So first of all, if we start off here, uh, let me just orient you here. So th this axis is going to be the measurement rate. So here, this is high, high measurements that destroy entanglement. Down here is low measurements where we have volume law. Here on the x-axis, I'm going to be plotting this uh, power law exponent alpha. 
So over here is going to be you know, nearest neighbor interactions. And over here is going to be tuning closer and closer to this long range interacting window. So when alpha is large, this term in the 2D theory becomes irrelevant in a, a RG sense. And so we actually just get the same nearest neighbor model that we started out with at the beginning. So you basically can just ignore this and understand the entire physics of this thing using the straight up regular old um, five four theory. <clears throat> now, as you start making alpha lower and lower, meaning that your power law interactions are getting larger and larger, you can see here that uh, the, the measurement rate increases, just like we saw from our previous model. So non-local non interactions tend to increase the measurement rate, and that's good. We also find, and I'm, I'm not going to be able to explain this intuitively in two seconds, but uh, we, we see that the critical exponent, sorry, the dynamical exponent uh, starts decreasing here. And that's, that's interesting and also matches some features that were found in numerics. And then finally, what's really interesting is uh, this is where the long range interactions really start to play a, a cool role. As soon as you hit this uh, uh, two alpha equals two point, you start getting, instead of just an area law uh, phase up here when measurements are too high, you actually get a fractally entangled phase, meaning that the entanglement entropy grows instead of not at all, or with linearly in A, it grows with some other power. It grows like the size of this region grows like the size of this region to some power that's not one. Okay, and then below the measure, critical measurement rate, so in this volume law entangled phase, you get the usual volume law term here, but then you also get this sub uh, correction. And these come from, you can calculate this quickly. There's some, if you have a domain wall like this, you can calculate there's some energy penalty of all of these guys disagreeing with all of these guys here. And you can calculate, there's an integral you can do that calculates the energy cost of these two regions, and it comes out to giving you this extra, this extra term here. <clears throat> okay, and I realize that I'm, you know, kind of, I'm skipping over all of the details, but the, the point I want to make is that this um, extra term at the end uh, contributes to the code distance. So I, I made this point earlier about Clifford circuits, and we can, you know, compute the mutual information and get the code distance. Um, this guy here, if you do a similar calculation, will lead you to a code distance where uh, it scales like a sub uh, uh, polynomial in the length L. Okay, so that's really nice. And it came out of this calculation that was exactly solvable. Um, right, okay, that brings me up to my last point. So these Brownian circuits are nice because we can actually study this long range interactions in a very solvable model. Um, and they can readily be extended to handle other things. Probably the next thing I want to do is write down this model for these sparsely non -interact or sparsely interacting things. And then finally, it gives an analytical understanding of this phase diagram, including this, uh, this code distance. Now there's this very, very important asterisk here. And this is the next thing I'm really excited about. Um, this calculation I told you about is only for Renyi 2. And in fact, it's only for quasi Renyi, uh, Renyi 2. Um, so actually, this kind of gets back to what uh, Masamachi was saying earlier, except it's, well, it's a different, different context, but so what, we're, what I, the whole talk I told you about, I, I was actually sweeping this under the rug. What we're really computing is not the Renyi 2 or the von Neumann or entry, anything. What we're actually computing is this funny quantity. And the point is that uh, when you do this measurement scheme, you end up getting non-normalized states. So at the end of this thing, you have to normalize by the by the probability, this is what's down here. This is just the probability that you got all of the measurement outcomes that you forced to get. Okay, so I know how to compute this thing, but this actually doesn't have any quantum information meaning. It's just some funny thing. So maybe we can do a step better. And instead of computing these two disorder average, by the way, sorry, this is disorder average over the Brownian couplings. And maybe we can do somewhat better. We can take a, a disorder average around the log, actually. So this would be the actual disorder average of the Rini 2. OK. Yeah. OK, thanks. Uh, OK, but I, you know, I don't know how to compute the expectation value of a log, but a standard replica trick, um, and this was pointed out by Adam Nahum and collaborators, um, you can compute these higher powers of these quantities and take the disorder average and then take the logarithm outside. And if you take a limit m equals zero, you'll get the right answer. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. If we're even more ambitious, 
maybe we can consider computing the von Neumann entropy, which can be obtained by a double replica limit. Okay, maybe if you're interested, I could explain that, but there's a formula. And the point is that in order to do this, one needs to be able to compute these traces and disorder averages for arbitrary n and m analytically, hopefully, well, you need to analytically, and then take this limit as m and, and go to one and zero. So let me get to you in just a second. So uh, this sounds kind of crazy, but actually Xiao Kai Jian and Brian Swingle very recently computed this quantity, the disorder average von Neumann entropy in a large N Brownian SYK model. So that gives me some hope that, and in fact, the features of this are pretty generic. And I think we should be able to see it in, in our qubit model as well. So that's, that's kind of my next area of interest. Um, with that, let me take your separate, you had a question. Yes. Um, don't you yeah that's right yeah so you could convince yourself that for instance this thing is um you know is self-averaging and so you don't need to consider this you know this uh disorder average is basically the same as this one because the denominator self-averages right and that's it's on the fourth Uh, well, are you, do you have in mind Clifford still? Okay. I guess I'd be worried. I'm, I'm not, I, I'm worried that the calculation could have, you know, higher moments could be important. I don't see why they're not immediately. Right. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. You, you could just calculate the fourth moment. And I, I see, I see. And then just convince yourself that that's small enough and that all higher moments are smaller than that. And so you can just ignore the yeah, whole. Then, yeah, for the range one, I'm just saying that for, 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 for the first line is actually range two. You can only say that the denominator doesn't work. Well right, right, exactly. Yeah, and I think. So that's, that's one thing I'd like to understand better. Uh, you know, one question could be, which models have that property that this is self-averaging? And, and you could add, you know, maybe there are other models that don't self-average. And yeah, I don't have a good understanding of which of that landscape, but yeah, that's a good question. You could, you could exactly, if, you, if this was self-averaging, you could hope to just get it straight from the, from the numerator. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. I think that'd be an interesting calculation to do actually is to take, like you're saying, take that previous model and somehow coarse grain over kind of a small enough region so that you can call that kind of a cluster and then those clusters interact. Well, for finite your model is exact, right? If you look to size at large, then you can just pick it and it's all size to the That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah, 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 that's right. So th yeah, that's probably exactly the thing to do. Right. Yeah, that, that would be really cool to see in, yeah, some like RG, you know, if you could write down a field theory for something and then say that if I coarse grain into these things and consider the interactions outside, yeah. I, I mean, I think that's right. I think it is almost identical, yeah. The microscopics are very different because in one case we have these sparse interactions and here we have these non-local or dense power law, but yeah. Okay, well, let me conclude quickly. So the, the uh, points I wanted to make here are that long interactions, sparse or dense, um, can improve the quantum codes that we get in this measurement-induced phase transition context. Um, and also that these Brownian models uh, give us some nice toy pictures that can really you know, provide us some mileage and give us analytical results. 
And in particular, I'm really excited about pushing this towards potentially the von Neumann entropy calculation. Okay, so let me thank my collaborators here, uh, Tom, Sebastian, and Andrew at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, and Shubayan, Shaofan, Brian uh, at, uh, well, Shubayan is at Maryland, the other two are at uh, Brandeis with me. So thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Um, strictly speaking, all of this is for the quantum dots having big dimensions to any big. Yeah. Um, do you know how to systematically include one over x? Yes, yes. That's another thing I would really like to do. I have not. That's been on my to do list. Um, no, it's, it's known that in the nearest neighbor system, whether the neighbor local space dimensions to infinity or not, changes in its completion. Yep, yep, that's exactly right. And you could expect that something here might might happen. It's, yeah, it's a very good point. It is something one should be worried about, for sure. So yeah, so computing one over n corrections and seeing if this thing is stable to that is definitely on my to-do list. Yeah. Yeah. Just a technical question. Can you use me as a continuum effective approach to compute this time entanglement quantity? Uh, this, so this, uh, so this picture here is if you take this A region to yeah. be the whole thing, it's equivalent to computing the reference entropy. Oh. Uh -huh. Well, more or less, cause you can, I don't know, flip the circuit around and pretend like the beginning was, you know, pretend like this region was connected to your reference qubits. But yeah, yeah. If, if you take the entanglement entropy of this entire region here, it's it's computing the entanglement between this and some other. Yeah. There's, there's probably more of a numerics question than the left side. So if you so if, right, when you do the numerics, you're actually simulating the Brownian surface, right? When I do the uh, so when I do the numerics on the non-local one, that's all Clifford. Oh, okay. it's all Clifford. Yeah, right. and, and it's because we want to get to large system sizes. Sure. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, do you have any intuition as to what happens if you allow for a, uh, a Hamiltonian that does not mean zero? So you're saying. It's a measuring term in the effective action, right? Um, and it's not obvious to me that these, are, these terms are irrelevant. Yeah. Well, so usually how this stuff goes is if you have a, a Brownian term and it's not mean zero, you can basically just subtract out that, you know, that subtract out the mean. And then you've got a Hamiltonian that has like kind of like just a constant strength part. And then you've got a fluctuating part. And so, you, you know, you can kind of solve the model without the disorder part and then add in the disorder average over the non Right, you can always sort of, I, does that make sense? You're sort of yeah, subtracting out the... I don't think you can really get rid of these. I mean, so when you do the Brownian average, you're really washing out any zero steps, right? That's right. Um, but if you pack a Hamiltonian there, and then non-mean zero Hamiltonian, you wouldn't be washing out all of those steps. That's right, so that's what this mean term would would yeah, yeah, would yeah. capture. Yeah, it, yeah. It, yeah, so do you have, yeah, do you have any idea what it, what it would do? Yeah, I... Um... Like, maybe it even smooths out the transition. Yeah, you want to have non. It would almost be like having you have an s dot s term with a non-zero. Yeah, I would guess that the only thing it would do would be to improve the transition. But it, 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 you could even switch off the randomness completely and ask if there's a measurement transition in the Hubble problem. Yeah, that's right. I don't have a good answer for you off the top of my head, but I, it's a good question. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. So, uh, thank uh, Jack again.